Hello and welcome back to Star of Books. As always, I'm reminded to please stay safe, healthy, hit that like button, subscribe, comment below, and hit the notification bell. Today we're getting back into Anne Rice's book two, The Vampire Chronicles of Vampire Lestat. And we are on part five of Viaticum for the Marquis. And without further ado, let's get there. All right, we're back on part five of uh, Vampire Lestat, Viaticum from the Marquis. By the hour of three, when we reached the livery stables, we knew we were being stalked by the presence. For half an hour, 45 minutes at a time, we wouldn't hear it, then the dull hum would come again. It was maddening me, and though we tried to tried hard to hear some intelligible thoughts from it, all we could discern was malice and an occasional tumult like the spectacle of dry leaves disintegrated it in the roar of the blaze. She was glad that we were riding home. It wasn't that the thing annoyed her. It was only what she had said earlier. She wanted the emptiness of the country, the quiet. When the open land broke before us, we were going so fast that the wind was the only sound, and I think I heard her laughing, but I wasn't sure. She loved the feel of the wind as I did. She loved the new brilliance of the stars over the darkened hills. But I wondered if there had been moments tonight when she had wept inwardly and I had not known. There had been times when we, when she was obscure and silent and her eyes quivered as if they were crying. But there was absolutely no tears. I was deep into thoughts of that. I think when we neared a dense wood that grew along the banks of a shallow stream and quite suddenly the mare reared and reared and lurched to the side, I was almost thrown. It was so unexpected. Gabrielle held on tight to my right arm. Every night I rode into this little glade, crashing over the narrow wood wooden bridge over the water. I loved the sound of the horse's hooves on the wood and the climb up the sloping bank, and my mare knew the path. But now she would have none of it. Shying, threatening to rear again, she turned of her own accord and galloped back towards Paris. Until, I swear, with all the power of my will, I commanded her, reining her in. Gabrielle was staring back at the thick copse, the great mass of dark, swaying branches that concealed the stream. And there came over the thin howling of the wind and the, that soft presence of rustling leaves, the definite pulse of the presence in the trees. We heard it at the same moment, surely because I tightened my arms around Gabriella as she nodded, gripping my hand. It's stronger, she said to me quickly, and there's not one alone. Yes, I said, enraged, and it stands between me and my lair. I drew my sword, bracing Gabriella in my left arm. You're not riding into it, she cried out. The hell I'm not, I said, trying to steady the horse. We don't have two hours before sunrise. Draw your sword. She tried to turn to speak to me, but I was already driving the horse forward. When she drew her sword, as I told her not to, as I told her to do, her little hand knotted around it as firmly as that of a man. Of course, the thing would flee as soon as we reached the cops. I was sure of that. I mean, the damn thing had never done anything but turn tail and run, and I was furious that it had frightened my mountain, that it was frightening Gabrielle. With a sharp kick and the full force of my mental persuasion. I sent the horse racing straight ahead to the bridge. I locked my head hand to the weapon and bent low with Gabrielle beneath me. I was breathing rage as if I were were dragon, and when the mare's hooves hit the hollow wood over the water, I saw them, the demons, for the first time. White faces and white arms above me, us. Glimpsed for no more than a second, and out of their mouths the most horrid shrieking as they shook the branches sending down on us a Shower of leaves. Damn you, you pack of harpies. I shouted as we reached the sloping bank on the other side, but Gabriella let out a scream. Something had landed <coughs> on the horse behind me, and the horse was slipping in the damp earth, and the thing had hold of my shoulder and the arm 
with which I tried to swing the sword. Whipping the sword over Gabrielle's head and down past my left arm, I shot at the creature furiously and saw it fly off a while blur a white blur in the darkness while another one sprang at us with hands like claws. Gabrielle's blade sliced right through its outstretched arm. I saw the arm go up into the air, the blood spurting as if from a fountain. The screams became a searing wail. I w wanted to slash every one of them to pieces. I turned the horse back to sh too sharply so that it reared and almost fell. But Gabrielle had hold of the horse's mane, and she drove it again towards the open road. As we raced for the tower, we could hear them screaming as they came on, and when the mare gave out, we abandoned her and ran, hand in hand, towards the gates. I knew we had to get through the second, the secret passage to the inner chamber before they climbed the outside wall. They must not see us take the stone out of place. And locking the gates and doors behind me as fast as I could, I carried Gabrielle up the stairs. By the time we reached the secret room and pushed the stone into place again, I heard their howling and shrieking below and their first scraping against the walls. I snatched up an armful of firewood and threw it beneath the window. Hurry the kindling, I said. But there was, there were half a dozen white faces already at the bars, their shrieks echoed monstrously in the little cell. For one moment I could only stare at them as I backed away. They clung to the iron gating like so many bats, but they weren't bats. They were vampires, and vampires as we were as we were vampires in human form. Dark eyes peered at us from under mops of filthy hair, howls growing louder and fiercer, the fingers that hung to the grating caked with filth. Such clothing as I could see was no more than colorless rags, and the stench coming from them was the graveyard stench. Gabrielle pitched the kindling at the wall, and she jumped away as they reached to catch hold of her. They bared their fangs, they screeched, hands struggled to pick up the firewood and threw it back at me, us. Altogether, they p pulled at the grating as if they might free it from the stone. Get the tinderbox, I shouted. I grabbed up one of the stouted pieces of wood and thrust it right at the closest f face, easily flinging the creature out and off out and off the wall, weak things. I heard it scream as it fell, but the others had clamped their hands on the wood, and they struggled with me now as I dislodged another dirty little demon, but by this time, Gabriel had lighted the kindling. The flame shot upwards. The howling stopped in a frenzy of ordinary speech. It's fire. Get back. Get down. Get out of the way, you idiots. Down, down. The bars are hot. Move away, quickly. Perfectly regular French, in fact, an ever-increasing flood of pretty vernacular curse words. I burst out laughing, stomping my foot and pointing it to them, pointing to them. As I looked at <coughs> Gabrielle, I curse on you, blasphemer, one of them screamed. When the fire looked at his hands and he howled, falling backwards, a curse on the profaners, the outlaws, came screams from below, it caught on quickly and became a regular chorus. I cursed on the outlaws who dared enter the house of God, but they were scrambling down to the ground. The heavy timbers were catching, and the fire was roaring to the ceiling. Go back to the graveyard where you came from, you pack of pranksters, I said. I would have thrown the fire down on them if I could have gotten near the window. Gabrielle stood, stood still with her eyes, narrow, obviously listening. Christen cries and howls continued from below new anthem of curse, curses upon those who broke the sacred laws, blasphemed, provoked the wrath of God and Satan. They were pulling on the gates and lower windows. They were doing stupid things like throwing rocks at the wall. They can't get in, Gabrielle said in a low monotone, her head still cocked attentively. They can't break the gate. I wasn't so certain. The gate was rusted very old, nothing to do but wait. I collapsed on the floor, leaning against the side of the sarcophagus. My arms around my chest and my back bent. I wasn't even laughing anymore. She too sat down against the wall with her legs sprawled out before her. Her chest heaved a little and her hair was coming loose from the braid. It was a cobra's hood around her face, loose strands clinging to her white cheek, soot clung to her garments. The heat of the fire was crushing. The airless room shimmered with vapors and the flames rose to shut out the night. 
but we could breathe the little air there was. We could breathe the little air there was. We suffered nothing except the fear and the exhaustion. And gradually I realized she was right about the ga gate. They hadn't managed to break it down. I could hear them drawing away. May the wrath of God punish the profane. There was some faint commotion near the stables. I saw in my mind my poor half-witted mortal stable boy dragged in terror from his hiding place, and my rage was redoubled. They were sending the image of it, images of it from their thoughts, the murder of that poor boy. Damn them. Be still, Gabrielle Sell said. It's too late. Her eyes widened and then grew small again as she listened. He was dead, the poor miserable creature. I felt the death just as if I had seen a small dark bird suddenly rising from the stables. She sat forward as though seeing it too, and then settled back as if she had lost consciousness, though she had not. She murmured, and it sounded like red velvet, but it was under her breath, and I didn't catch the words. I'll punish you for this, you gang of ruffians, I said aloud. I sent it out towards them. You trouble my house, I swear you'll pay for this. But my limbs were getting heavier and heavier. The heat of the fire was almost drugging. All the night's strange happenings were taking their toll. In my exhaustion and in the glare of the fire, I could not guess the hour. I think I fell to dreaming for an instant and woke myself with sh a shiver. Unsure of how much time had passed, I looked up and saw the figure of an unearthly young boy. An exquisite young boy, pacing the floor of the chamber. Of course it was only Gabrielle. Part 6. Viaticum for the Marquis. She gave the impression of almost rampant strength as she walked back and forth, yet all of it was contained in an unbroken grace. She kicked at the timbers and watched the blackened ruin of the fire flare for a moment before settling it itself again. Ouch. Sorry. I could see the sky. An hour perhaps remained. But who are they? she asked. She stood over me, her legs apart, her hands in two liquid summoning gestures. Why do they call us outlaws and blasphemers? told you everything I know, I confessed. Until tonight, I didn't think they possessed faces or limbs or real voices. Climbed to my feet and brushed off my clothes. They damned us for entering the churches, she said. Did you catch it? Catch it? Those images coming from them. They don't know how we managed to do it. They themselves would not dare. For the first time, I observed that she was trembling. There were other small signs of alarm. The way the flesh quivered around her eyes. The way that she kept pushing the loose strands of her hair out of her eyes again. Gabrielle, I said. Try to make my tone authoritative, reassuring. The important thing is to get out of here now. We don't know how early those creatures rise, or how soon after sunset they'll return. We have to discover another hiding place. The dungeon crypt, she said. Worse trap than this, I said. They break through the gate, I glanced at the sky again. I pulled the stone of the low passage. Come on, I said. But where are we going, she asked. For the first time tonight, she looked... Almost fragile, to a village east of here, I said. It's perfectly obvious that the safest place is within the village church itself. Would you do that, she asked, in the church? Of course I would. As you just said, the little beasts would never dare to enter, and the crypts under the altar will be as dark, deep and dark as any grave. But Lestat, to rest under the very altar. Mother, you astonish me, I said. I have taken victims under the very roof of Notre Dame. But another little idea came to me. I went to Magnus's chest and started picking at the heap of treasure. I pulled out two rosaries, one of pearls, starnished of emeralds, excuse me, another of emeralds, both having the unusual, the usual small cru crucifix. <coughs> she watched me, her face white, pinched. Here, you take this one, I said, giving her the emerald rosary. Keep it on you. If and when we do meet with them, show, me, show them the crucifix. If I'm right, they'll run from it. What happens if we don't find a safe place in the church? How the hell should I know? We'll come back here. I could feel a fear collecting in her and radiating from her as she hesitated, looking through the windows at the fading stars. She had passed with a veil into the promise of eternity. Now she was in danger again. Quickly, I took the rosary from her and kissed her and slipped the rosary into the pocket of her frock coat. Emeralds mean eternal life, Mother, I said. She appeared the boy standing there again last glow of the fire, just tracing the line of her cheek and mouth. It's as I said before, she whispered. You aren't afraid of anything, aren't are you? What does it matter if I am or not? I shrugged. I took her arms and arm and drew her to the passage. We are the things that others fear, I said. Remember that. 
When we reached the stable, I saw the boy had been hideously murdered. His broken body lay twisted on the hay-strewn floor as if it had been flung there by a titan. The back of his head was shattered, and to mock him, it seemed, or to mock me, they had dressed him in a gentleman's fancy velvet frock coat, red velvet. Those were the words she'd murmured when they had done the crime. I'd seen only the death. I looked away now in disgust. All the horses were gone. They'll pay for that, I said. I took her hand, but she stared at the miserable boy's body as it as if it drew her against her will. She glanced at me. I feel cold, she whispered, losing the strength of my limbs. I must, I must get to where it's dark. I can feel it. I led her fast over the rise of the nearby hill and towards the road. There was no howling little monsters hidden in the village churchyard, of course. I didn't think there would be. The earth hadn't been turned up on the old graves in a long time. Gabrielle was past conferring with me on this, half carried her to the por to the side door of the church, and quietly broke the latch. I'm cold all over. My eyes are burning, she said again under her breath. Someplace dark. But as I stared to take her, started to take her in, she stopped. What if they are right, she said. And we don't belong in the house of God. Gibberish and nonsense. God isn't in the house of God. Don't, she moaned. I pulled her through the sacristy and out before the altar. She covered her face, and when she looked up, it was at the crucifix over the tabernacle. She let a long, low gasp, but it was from the stained glass windows that she shielded her eyes, turning her head towards me. The rising sun that I could not even feel yet was already burning her. I picked her up as I had done last night. I had to find an old burial crypt, one that hadn't been used in years. I hurried towards the Blessed Virgin's altar, where the inscription so were war almost went away. And kneeling, I hooked my fingernails around a slab and quickly lifted it to reveal a steep sepulcher, a sepulcher, something like that, with a single rotted coffin. I pulled her down into the sepulcher with me and moved the slab back into, back into place inky blackness and the coffin splintering under me so that my right hand closed on a crumbling skull. I felt the sharpness of other bones under my chest. Gabrielle spoke as if in a trance. Yes, away from the light. We're safe, I whispered. Pushed the bones out of the way, making a nest of the rotted wood and the dust that was too old to contain any smell of human decay. But I did not fall into the sleep for perhaps an hour or more. <coughs> I kept thinking that over and over, thinking over and over, the stable boy. Mauled and thrown there in the fancy red velvet frock coat. I had seen the coat before, and I couldn't remember where I had seen it. Had it been one of my own? Had they gotten into the tower? No, that was not possible. They couldn't have gotten in. Had they had, they had a coat made up identical to one of my own? Gone to such lengths to mock me? No, how could such creatures do a thing like that? But still, this that particular coat... Something about it. Part 7 of My Viaticum for the Marquis. I heard the softest, loveliest singing when I opened my eyes, and as sound can often, can often do, even the most precious fragments, it took me back to childhood, to some night in winter when all my family had gone down to the church in our village and stood for hours among the blazing candles, breathing, the heavy sensual smell of the incense as the priest walked in procession with the monstrous lifted high. Excuse me, with the monstrous lifted high. I remember the sight of the round white host behind the thick glass, the starburst of gold and jewels surrounding it, and overhead the embroidered canopy, swaying dangerously as the altar boys in their lace surplices tried to steady it as they moved on. A thousand benedictions after that one had engraved into my mind the words of the old hymn, and the old hymn isn't Latin, so we'll just bypass that. And as I lay in the remains of this broken coffin under the white marble slab at the side altar in this large country church, Gabrielle's clinging to me still in, this, in the paralysis of sleep, I realized very slowly that above me were hundreds upon hundreds of humans was singing this very hymn right now. The church was full of people. And we could not get out of this damn nest of bones until all of them went away. Around me in the dark, I could feel creatures moving. I could smell the shattered, crumbling skeleton on which I lay. I could smell the earth, too, 
feel dampness and the harshness of the cold. Gabrielle's hands were dead. Dead hands holding to me. Her face was inflexible as bone. I tried not to brood on this, but to lie perfectly still. Hundreds of humans breathed inside above. Perhaps a thousand of them. And now they moved on into the second hymn. What comes now, I thought dismally, the litany, the blessings. On this it's night of all nights, I had no time to lie here musing. I must get out. The image of that red velvet coat came to me again with an irrational sense of urgency and a flash of equally inexplicable pain. And quite suddenly, it seemed, Gabrielle opened her eyes. Of course, I didn't see it. It was utterly black here. I felt it. I felt her limbs come to life. And no sooner had she moved than the, she grew positively rigid with alarm. I slipped my hand over her mouth. Be still, I whispered, but I could feel her panic. All the horrors of the preceding night must be coming back to her. That she was now in a sepulcher with a broken skeleton, that she lay beneath a stone she could hardly lift. We are in the church, I whispered, and we are safe. <clears throat> the singing... Sir John Tantum, Ergo, Sacramentum, Venere, Mer, Cerne. Can't read. No, it's a benediction. Gabrielle gasped. She's trying to lie still. But abruptly, the lost, she lost the struggle, and I had to grip her firmly in both arms. We must get out, she whispered. Let's out. The blessed sacrament is on this al altar for the love of God. The remains of the wooden coffin clattered and creaked against the stone beneath it causing me to roll over on top of her and force her flat with my weight. Oh, lie still, do you hear me, I said? We have no choice but to wait. But a panic was infecting me. I felt the fragments of bone cr crunching beneath my knees and smelled the rotting cloth. It seemed the dead death stench was penetrating the walls of the sepulcher, and I knew I could not bear to be shut up with that stench. We can't, she gasped. Can't remain here. I have to get out. She was almost whimpering. Well, Dad, I can't. She was feeling the walls with both hands and then the stone above us. I heard a pure, toneless sound of terror issue from her lips. Above, the hymn had stopped. The priest would go up the altar steps, lift the monstrance in both hands, he would turn to the congregation and raise the sacred host in blessing. Gabrielle knew that, of course. <coughs> Gabrielle suddenly went mad, writhing under me, almost heaving me to the side. All right, listen to me, I hissed. I could control this no longer. We are going out, but we shall do it like proper vampires, do you hear? There are one hundred there are one thousand people in the church, and we are going to scare them to death. I will lift a stone and we will rise up together. We do raise your arms and make the most horrible face you can muster and cry out if you can. That will make them fall back instead of pouncing upon us and dragging us off to prison and then we'll be rushed to the door. She couldn't even stopped to answer. She was already struggling, slamming the rotted boards with her heels. I rose up, giving the marble slab a great shove with both hands, and leapt out of the vault just as I had said I would do. <coughs> <coughs> Pulling my cloak up in a giant arc. I landed upon the floor of the choir in a blaze of candlelight, letting out the most powerful cry I could make. Hundreds rose to their feet before me, Hundreds of miles opening to scream. Giving another shout, I grabbed Gabrielle's hand and lunged towards them. Leaping over the communion rail, she gave a lovely high-pitched wail, her left hand raised as a claw as I pulled her down the aisle. Everywhere there was panic, men and women clutching for children, shrieking and falling backwards. The heavy doors gave at once. On the black sky and the gusting breeze, I threw Gabrielle ahead of me, and turning back, made the loudest shriek that I could, bared my fangs at the writhing, screaming congregation. And unable to tell whether some pursued or merely fell towards me in panic, I reached into my pockets and showered the marble floor with gold coins. The devil throws money, someone screeched. We tore through the cemetery and across the fields. Within seconds, we had gained the woods, and I could smell the stables of a large house that lay ahead of us beyond the trees. I stood still, bent almost double in concentration, and summoned the horses. And we ran towards them, hearing the dull thunder of their hooves against the stalls. 
bolting over the low edge hedge with Gabrielle beside me, I pulled the door of the hinges just as a fine gelding raced out of his broken stall, and we sprang onto his back. Gabrielle scrambled into place before me as I threw my arm around her. I dug my heels into the animal and rode south into the woods and towards Paris, part eight, my viaticum for the Marquis. I tried to form a plan as we approached this city, but in truth I was not sure at all how to proceed. There's no avoiding some of these filthy little monsters. We were riding towards a battle, and it was little different from the morning on which I'd gone out to kill the wolves, counting upon my rage and my will to carry me through. We had scarcely entered the scattered farmhouses of Mont Marte when we heard for a split second their faint murmuring noxious as a vapor. It seemed. Ga Gabrielle and I knew we had to drink at once in order to be prepared for them. We stopped at one of the small farms, crept through the orchard to the back door, and found inside the man and wife dozing in an empty heart. Poor people. When it was finished, we came out of the house together and into the little kitchen garden where we stood still for a moment looking at the pearl gray sky. No sound of others, only the stiffness, only the stillness, the clarity of the fresh blood and the threat of rain as the clouds gathered overhead. I turned and silently bid the Jeldon to come to me and gathered to the reins. I turned to Gabrielle. See no other way to, to go into Paris, I told her, to face these little beasts head on, and until they show themselves, start the war all over again, there are things that I must do. I have to think about Nicky. I have to talk to Roger. The dirt of the... Church sepulcher still clung to the cloth of her coat and her blonde hair, and she looked like an angel dragged in the dust. I won't have them come between me and what I mean to do, she said. I said. She took a deep breath. Do you want to lead these creatures to your blub, Monsieur Roger? she asked. That was too dreadful to contemplate. The first few drops of rain were falling, and I felt cold in spite of the blood. In a moment it would be raining hard. All right, I said. Nobody, nothing can be done until this... Is finished, I said. I mounted the horse and reached for her hand. Injury only spurs you on, doesn't it? She asked. She was studying me. I. It would only strengthen you when whatever they did or tried to do. Now this is what I call mortal nonsense, I said. Come on. <coughs> the stat, she said soberly. They put your stable boy in a gentleman's frock coat after they killed him. Kill. Did you see the coat? Hadn't you seen it before? The damned red velvet coat. I have seen it, she said. I had looked at it for hours at my bedside in Paris. It was Nic Nicholas Delafont's coat. I looked at her for a long moment, but I don't think I saw her at all. The rage building in me was absolutely silent. It will be rage until I have proof that it must be grief, I thought. Then I wasn't thinking. Vaguely, I knew she had no notion yet how strong our passions could be, how they could paralyze us. I think I moved my lips, but nothing came out. I don't think they've killed him, Lestat, she said. Again, I tried to speak. I wanted to ask, why do you say that? But I couldn't. I was staring forward into the orchard. I think he is alive, she said, and that he is their prisoner. Otherwise, they would have left his body there and never bothered with that stable boy. Perhaps, perhaps not. I had to force my mouth to form the words. The coat was a message. I couldn't stand this any longer. I'm going after them, I said. Do you want to return to the tower? I fail at this. I have no intention of leaving you, she said. The rain was falling in earnest, and by the time we reached the boulevard du Temple, and the wet paving stones magnified a thousand lamps, my thoughts had hardened into strategies that were more instinct than reason, and I was as ready for a fight as I have ever been. But we had to find out where we stood. How many of them were there? And what did they really want? Was it to capture and destroy us? Or to frighten us and drive us off? I had to quell my rage. I had to remember they were... <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. They were the child of superstitions. Conceivably easy to scatter or scare. As soon as we reached the high ancient tenements near Notre Dame, I heard them near us. The vibration 
coming as in a silver flash and vanishing as quickly again. Got yeah. ball you. I'm sorry. Gabrielle drew herself up and I felt her left hand on my wrist. I saw her right hand on the hilt of her sword. We had entered a crooked alleyway that turned bl blindly in the dark in front of us, the iron clatter of the horse's shoes shattering the silence, and I shrugged not to be unnerved by the sound itself. <laughs> It seemed we saw them at the same moment. Gabrielle pressed to get back against me, and I swallowed the gasp that would have given an impression of oh, sorry, she got her fog at me. Impression of fear. High above us, on either side of the narrow thoroughfare. Stop. Hey. Sorry. Right. No biting. No attacking. I swallowed the gasp that would have given an impression of fear high above us on either side of the narrow thoroughfare were there white faces just over the eaves of the tenements a faint gleam against the lowering sky and the soundless drifts of silver rain she's getting ready to go wild I drove the horse toward forward in a rush of scraping and clattering above they streaked like rats over the roof the voices rose in a faint Howling mortals, and the faint howling mortals could never have heard. Gabrielle stifled a little cry as we saw their white arms and legs descending the walls instead of ahead of us. And behind I heard the soft thud of their feet on the stones. Straight on I shouted, in my, and drawing my sword I drove right over the two ragged figures who who dragged who dropped down in our path. Damnable creatures out of my way, I shouted, hearing their screams underfoot. I glimpsed again anguished faces for a ma moment. Those above vanished and those behind us seemed to weaken, and we bore ahead, putting yards between us and our pursuers as we came into the deserted deserted place to grieve. But they were gathering on the edges of the square, and this time I was hearing their distinct thoughts one of them demanding what power was it we had and why should they be frightened, another insisting that they close in. Some force surely came from Gabrielle at that moment because so I could see them visibly fall back when she threw her glance in their direction and tightened her grip on the sword. Stop, stand them off, she said under her breath. They are terrified. Then I heard her curse because flying towards us out of the Shadows of the Hotel Dew, there came a, at least six more of the little demons. Their thin white limbs, barely swathed in rags, their hair flying, those dreadful wails coming out of their mouths. They were rallying the others. Their, the malice that surrounded us when, was gaining force. The horse reared and almost threw us. They were commanding it to halt as surely as I commanded it to go on. I grabbed Gabrielle about the waist, leapt off the horse, and ran the top. Ran, ran top speed at the doors of Notre Dame. A horrid derisive babble rose silent in my ears. Wails and cries and threats. You dare not, you dare not. Malice like the heat of a <coughs> blast furnace opened upon us. <coughs> <coughs> As their feet came thump <coughs> <coughs> thumping and splashing around us and I felt their hands struggling to grab hold of my sword and my coat. <clears throat> but I was certain of what would happen when we reached the church. I gave it one final spurt, heaving Gabrielle out of me so that <clears throat> <clears throat> together we slid through the doors across the threshold of the cathedral and landed sprawling within on the stones. Screams, dreadful screams, curling upwards, and then upheaval as the entire mob been scattered by a cannon blast. I scrambled to my feet, laughing out loud at them, but I was not waiting to, ne to so near the door to hear more. Gabrielle was on her feet and pulling me after her, and together we hurried deep into the shadowy nave, past one lofty archway after another, until we were near the dim candles of the sanctuary. <coughs> and then... 
seeking a dark and empty corner by a side altar, we sank down together on our knees. Be nice. Just like those damn wolves, I said. A bloody ambush. Shh. Be quiet a moment, Gabrielle said, as she clung to me, or my immortal heart will burst. Part 9 of Viaticum for the Marquis. She only have a few more pages in this here. Yeah. After a long moment, I felt her stiffen. She was looking towards the square. Don't think of Nicholas, she said. They're waiting and they're listening. They're hearing everything that goes on in our minds. But what are they thinking, I whispered. What is going on in their heads? I could feel her concentration. I pressed her close and looked straight at the silver light that came through the distant open doors. I could hear them, too, now, just that the, but just that lower sh low shimmer of sound coming from all of them collected them, collected there. But as I stared at the rain, there came over me the strongest sense of peace. It was almost sensuous. It seemed to me we could yield to them, but it was foolish to resist them further. All things would be resolved were we merely to go out to them and give ourselves over. They would not torture Nicholas, whom they had in their power. They would not tear him limb from limb. I saw Nicholas in their hands. He wore only his lace shirt and breeches because they had taken the coat. And I heard his screams as they pulled his arms from the sockets. Oof. I cried out, no, putting my hand, own hand over my mouth so that it did not rouse the mortals in the church. Gabrielle reached up and touched my lips with her fingers. It's not being done to him, she said under her breath. It's merely a threat. Don't think of him. He's still alive, then I whispered. So they want us to believe. Listen. There came again the sense of peace, the summon that's what it was to join them. The voice crying, come out of the the church, surrender to us. We welcome you. We will not harm either of you, if only you come. I turned towards the door and rose to my feet. Anxiously, Gabrielle rose beside me, cautioning me again with her hand. She seemed wary of even speaking to me as we both looked at that great archway of silvery light. You were lying to us, I said. You have no power over us. It was a rolling current of defiance. Moving through the distant door, surrender to you we do that, then what's to stop you from holding the three of us? Why should we come out? Within this church we are safe. We can conceal ourselves as deep as burial vaults. We could hunt among the faithful, drink their blood on, in the chapels and niches so skillfully we'd never be discovered, sending our victims out confused to die in the streets afterwards. And what would you do? You, would, you cannot even cross the door? Besides, we don't believe you have Nicholas. Show him to us. Let him come to the door and speak. Gabrielle was in a welter of confusion. She was scanning me, desperate to know what I said, and she was clearly hearing them, which I could not do when I was sending these impulses. It seemed their pulse weakened, but it had not stopped. It went on as it had before, as if I had not answered it, as if it was someone humming. It was promising tr truce again, and now it seemed to speak of rapture that in the great pleasure of joining with it, all conflict would be resolved. It was sensuous again. It was beautiful. Miserable cowards, a lot of you, I sighed, said the words aloud this time. So that Gabrielle could hear as well, send Nicholas into the church. The hum of the voices became thin. I went on, but beyond it there was a hollow silence, as if other voices had been withdrawn and only one or two remained now. Then I heard the thin, chaotic strains of argument and rebellion. Gabrielle's eyes narrowed. Silence. Only mortals out there, weaving their way against the wind across the place to grieve. I didn't believe they would withdraw. Now what to do to save Nicky? I blinked my eyes. I felt wary suddenly. It was almost a feeling of despair, and I thought confusedly, This is ridiculous. I never despair. Others do that, not me. I go on fighting no matter what happens, always, and in my exhaustion and anger, I saw Magnus leaping and jumping in the fire, I saw the grimace of his face before the flames consumed him, and he disappeared. Was that despair? The thought I thought paralyzed me, horrified me, as the reality of it had done them, then, and I had the old, oddest feeling that someone else was speaking to me of Magnus. That is why the thought of Magnus had come into my head. Too clever, Gabrielle whispered. Don't listen to it. It's playing tricks with our very thoughts, I said. 
but as I stared past her at the open doorway, I saw a small figure appear, com compact. It was the figure of a young boy, not a man. I ached for it to be Nicholas, but I knew immediately that it was not. It was smaller than Nicholas, though rather heavier build, and the creature was not human. Gabriel made so some soft, wondering sound. It sounded almost like prayer in its reference. The creature wasn't dressed as men dressed now. Rather, he wore a belted tunic, very graceful and stockinged on his well-shaped legs. His sleeves were deep, hanging at his sides. He was clothed like Magnus, actually. And for moment, one moment I thought madly that by some magic was Magnus returned. Stupid thought. This was a boy, as I had said, and he had had of long curly hair, and he walked very straight and very simply through the silvery light and into the church. He hesitated for a moment, and by the tilt of the head it seemed he was looking up, and then he came on through the nave and towards us, his feet making not the faintest sound on the stones. He moved into the glow with the candles on the side altar. His clothes were black, velvet once beautiful, and now eaten away by time and crusted with dirt but his face was shining white and perfect, the countenance of a god, it seemed, a cupid and of Caravaggio, seductive yet ethereal, with auburn hair and dark brown eyes. I held Gabriel closer as I looked at him, and nothing so startled me about him. This inhuman creature she's going crazy over there. As the manner in which she was staring at us. <laughs> I know, Jim, she's going wild. He was inspecting every detail of our persons, and then he reached out very gently and touched the stone of the altar at his side. He stared at the altar, at its crucifix, and its saints, and then he looked back at us. He was only a few yards away, and the soft inspection of us yielded to an expression that was almost sublime. And the voice I'd heard before came out of the creature summoning us again, calling upon us to yield, saying with indescribable gentleness that we must love one another, he and Gabrielle, whom he didn't call by, by name, and I. There was something na naive about it, his sending the summons as he stood there. I held fast against him. Instinctively, I felt my eyes becoming opaque as if a wall had gone up to seal off the windows of my thoughts, and yet I felt such a longing for him, such a longing to fall into him, and follow him and be led by him, that all my longings of the past seemed nothing at all. He was all mystery to me as Magnus had been, only he was beautiful, indescribably beautiful. There seemed in him an infinite complexity and depth which Magnus had not possessed. The anguish of my immortal life pressed in on me, he said, Come to me, come to me, because I, only I in my life can end the loneliness you feel. Touched a well of inexpressible sadness had sounded the depth of the sad sounded the depth of sadness, and my throat went dry with a powerful little gnaw where my voice might have been, yet I held fast. We two were together, I insisted, tightening my grip on Gabrielle, and then I asked him, Where's Nicholas? I asked. That question clung to it, yielding to nothing that I heard or saw. He moistened his lips, very human thing to do, and silently he approached us until he was standing no more than two feet from us, looking from one of us to the other, and in a voice very unlike a human voice, he spoke. Magnus, he said. It was unobtrusive. It was caressing. He went into the fire, as you said. I never said it, I answered. The human sound of my own voice startled me, but I knew now he meant my thoughts of only moments before. It's quite true, I answered. He went into the fire. Why should I deceive anyone on that account? I tried to penetrate his mind. He knew I was doing it, and he threw up against me such strange images that I gasped. What was it I'd seen for an instant? I didn't even know. Hell and heaven are both made one. Vampires in a paradise drinking blood from the very flowers that hung, pendulous and throbbing from the trees. I felt a wave of disgust. It was as if he had come into my private life, my private dreams like a succubus. But he had stopped. He let his eyes pucker slightly and he looked down out of some vague respect. My disgust was withering him. He hadn't anticipated my response. He hadn't expected what? Such strength? 
Yes, and he was letting me know it is an almost courteous in an almost courteous way. I returned the courtesy. I let him see me in the tower room with Magnus, called Magnus's words before he went into the fire. I let him know all of it. He nodded, and when I told the, the words Magnus had said, there was a slight change in his face, as if his forehead had gone smooth or all of his skin had tightened. He gave me no such knowledge of himself in answer. On the contrary, much to my surprise, he looked away from us to the main altar of the church. He glided past us, turning his back to us as if he had nothing to fear from us and had for the moment forgotten us. He moved towards the great aisle and he slowly and slowly up to it, but he did not appear to walk in a human way. Rather, he moved so swiftly from one bit of shadow to another that he seemed to vanish and reappear. Never was he visible in the light, and those scores of souls milling in the church had only to glance at him to, for him to instantly disappear. I marveled at his skill because that is all it was, and curious to see if I could move like that, followed him to the choir. Gabrielle came after without a sound. I think we both found it simpler than we had imagined it than we had imagined it would be. Yet he was clearly startled when he saw us at this at his side. In the very act of being startled he gave me a glimpse of his great weakness, pride. He was humiliated that we had crept up on him, moving so lightly and managing at the same time to conceal our thoughts. But worse was to come. When he realized that I had a perceived this, it was revealed for a split second. He was doubly raged. The withering heat emanated from him. That wasn't heat at all. Gabrielle made a little scornful sound. Her eyes flashed on him for a second, some shimmer of communication between them that excluded him me. He seemed puzzled, but he was in the grip of some greater battle I was struggling to understand. He looked at the faithful around him at the altar and all the emblems of the Almighty and the Virgin Mary everywhere to be turned. He was perfectly the god out of Caravaggio, the light playing on the hard whiteness of his innocent-looking face. Then he put his arm around my wa about my waist, slipping it under my cloak. His touch was so strange, so sweet and enticing, and the beauty of his face so entrancing that I didn't move away. He put his other arm around Gabrielle's waist in the sight of them together. Angel and an Angel distracted him. He said, you must come. Why? Where? Gabrielle asked. I felt an immense pressure. He was attempting to move me against my will, but he could not. I planted myself on the stone floor. I saw Gabrielle's face harden as she looked at him, and again he was amazed. He was maddened, and he couldn't conceal it from us. So he had underestimated our physical strength as well as our mental strength. Interesting. He must come now, he said, giving me the great force of his will, which I could see much too clearly to be fooled. Come out, and my followers won't harm you. You're lying to us, I said. You send your followers away, and you want us to come out before your followers return, because you don't want them to see you come out of the church. You don't want them to know you came into it. Again, Gabrielle gave a little scornful laugh, put my hand on his chest, and tried to move him away. He might have been as strong as Magnus, but I refused to be afraid. Why do you want them to see, I whispered, peering into his face. Why don't you want them to see us, whispered, peering in his face. The change in him was so startling and so ghastly that I found myself holding my breath. His angelic countenance peered with her. His eyes widening and his mouth twisting down in consternation, his entire body became quite deformed as if he were trying not to grit his teeth and clench his fists. Gabrielle drew away. I laughed. I didn't really mean it, but I couldn't help it. It was horrifying, but it was also very funny. With stunning suddenness, this awful illusion, if that is what it was, faded and he came back to himself. Even the sublime expression returned. He told me in a steady stream of thought that I was infinitely stronger than he supposed, but it would frighten the others to see him emerge from the church, and so we should go at once. Lies again. Gabriel whispered, I knew this much pride would forgive nothing. God help Nicholas if I couldn't trick this one. Turning, I took Gabriel's hand, and we started down the aisle to the front doors, Gabriel glancing back at him and to me questioningly, her face white and tense. Patience, I whispered. 
I turned to see him far away from us, his back to the main altar, and his eyes were so big as he stared that he looked horrible to me, loathsome like a ghost. When I reached the vestibule, I sent out my summons to the others with all my power, and I whispered aloud for Gabrielle as I did so. I told them to come back and into the church if they wanted to, and that nothing could harm them. Their leader was inside the church, standing at the very altar unharmed. I spoke the words louder, pumping the summons on to the words, and Gabrielle joined me, repeating the phrases in unison with me. I felt him coming towards us from the main altar, and then suddenly I lost him. I didn't know where he was behind me. He grabbed hold of me suddenly and materializing at my side. Gabrielle was thrown to the floor. He was attempting to light, lift, and pitch me through the door. But I fought him, and desperately collecting everything I remembered of Magnus' a strange walk, this creature's strange manner of moving, I hurled him. Not enough balance as one might do to a heavy mortal, but straight up in the air. Just as I suspected, he went over in a somersault, crashing into the wall. Mortals stirred, and they saw movement, heard noises, but he'd vanished again, and Gabrielle and I looked no different from other young gentlemen in the shadows. I motioned for Gabrielle to get out of the way, then he appeared, shooting towards me. But I perceived what was to happen and stepped aside. Some twenty feet away from me, I saw him sprawled on the stone, staring at me in po positive awe. as if I were a god. His long auburn hair was tossed about his brown eyes, enormous as he looked up. And for all the gentle innocence of his face, his will was rolling over me, a hot stream of commands telling me I was weak and imperfect and a fool, and I would be torn limb from limb by his followers as soon as they appeared. They roast my mortal lover slowly till he died. I laughed silently. This was in the, as ludicrous as a fight out of the old com comedia. Gabrielle was... Staring from one to the other of us. I spent I sent the summons again to the others, and this time when I sent it, I heard them answering, questioning. Come into the church, I repeated it over and over. Even as he rose and run at me again in blind and clumsy rage. My sweetheart. Gabriel caught him just as I did, and we both had hold of him, and he couldn't move. In a moment of absolute horror for me, he tried to sink his fangs into my neck. I saw his eyes round and empty as he is fat, as the fangs descended over his drawn lips. Lip. I flung him back again. He vanished. They were coming nearer the others. Coming nearer the others. And he's in the church. Alita, look at him, I repeated. And any of you can come into the church. You won't be hurt. Her Gabrielle let a scream of warning, and it's too late. He rose up right in front of me as if out of the floor itself. Struck my jaw, jerking my head back so that I saw the church ceiling and before I could recover he had dealt me one final blow in the middle of the back that sent me flying out the door and onto the stones of the square and the viaticum for the marquee in the next video we'll get to part four the children of darkness and category one. Oh, pandora move she's gonna scratch me i hope you enjoyed this video please be sure to hit the like button subscribe comment below and hit the notification bell you stay safe and healthy and you stay cool.